Frank Heider is a well-known, renowned visual artist. When he started to become an artist, he thought the journey would be a straightforward progression. Over the years, he has discovered that the road has many twists and turns, numerous hills and valleys, and countless challenges. Through this series of short stories, tales, and remembrances, his hope is that these will offer some valuable insight into the life of an artist and what's involved in becoming an artist. In the end, he has come to realize that he is not a painter, or sculptor, or anything in particular. He is more simply a creative person, with great passion and love for the process of making art concerning people and the world around us, who shares his artworks with the public. Join us now as we listen to another episode of A Life in Art series. Sometimes, uh, when you're learning to become an artist, you have to come to the reality that uh, you may have a family, but that family is not necessarily your artistic family. That many artists have descendants or antecedents or ancestors who are not really related to them, but who are spiritually or figuratively related in their work. And uh, when I went to uh, study painting with Neil Welliver in Philadelphia, uh, I had been led to Neil Welliver by another artist who saw enormous parallels in our work. And uh, uh, she, she insisted that he was the person who would understand what I was doing best of all. So anyway, um, I applied and I got accepted which meant that he had also seen something in the work. Anyway, why, as we began uh, working together, he was he was very very hard on me. He 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 tolerated uh, no mistakes. He he was very particular. He pointed out where I didn't get something right and how I should do it over and do a painting again, get it right the second time, take care to mix it the color more carefully, make sure I, I paid better attention to the subject, etc. He would point things out to me and then leave the room, and I had to figure it out from that point on. Anyway, as time progressed, he became very much involved with uh, visiting my studio, and I was, sometimes he would, you know, some weeks he would not visit a studio, but he never missed mine. He was always there. And he was always, I was the first person he saw every week. He would be in my studio. He'd spend a lot of time. He would deliver his idea to me and then leave. And then as the year progressed, he saw to it that I got considerable amount of scholarship aid so that I, I financially was able to afford to be in school. And then in my second semester, he came in one day and awarded me a, a Skowhegan uh, mem uh, uh, scholarship, which I didn't know anything at all about the Skowhegan School. Looking back on it, um, the Skowhegan School is the most uh, uh, exceptional place I ever went, and uh, he picked me for that, and I, I was grateful for that as well. And as every year that I studied with him, um, I got to know him a little better. Uh, I was invited, he lived in Maine, and I was invited to his studio a couple of times. When I was at Skowhegan, I went over there. It was about an hour and a half away from Skowhegan. Neil lived on 1,500 acres of uh, woods on the coast of Camden, Maine, uh, in a really beautiful part of the Maine landscape. Um, and he lived in an 18th century farmhouse that had been built somewhere else, taken apart and reassembled on the lot that he had in this 1,500 acres. And he had a big barn alongside, which was his working studio. When you would go into his studio, <clears throat> he had these, he would make these small paintings from nature, and then he would make big giant pencil drawings on white paper with very very simple pencil lines but they were extremely detailed and they were huge they were eight feet square six by eight feet and they were just 
thousands of little parts in all of these drawings. So he would make these very careful drawings and then using a technique that I didn't really know before I saw it there, he would use what was called a pouncing wheel. And a pouncing wheel is used uh, in, by uh, fresco painters and also by dress designers. And it looks like a little wheel with points on it and you roll it across a line and it makes tiny holes in the fabric or the paper. And so he would go over this whole drawing that he had made on this paper, make all these little punching holes, and then after it was all done, he would lay the, the drawing paper over top of a white canvas and then taking a bag of charcoal that was in a cotton bag it was all crushed charcoal and he would smack it against the paper and that was called pouncing so he'd pounce the drawing with that little bag of charcoal and as he pounced on it it little puffs of of dust would come off the paper and when he would lift the paper off on the canvas behind there was these tiny little black dots thousands of tiny little black dots. It was in most mysterious and interesting looking object because you could tell it was an image, but you couldn't tell what the image was. But every line stood for something in the original drawing. So after he was done all of that, he would spray it with fixative to keep the, the little dots from moving away. And then he would begin to mix his color. And he would put this huge canvas against the wall. Now, Neil was only five feet tall, so he'd be working on a canvas that was six to eight feet tall, and he'd walk over to the canvas with a ladder, and he would start painting at the very top of the painting, and he would move all the way from the left to the right-hand side, and it moved down an inch at a time. It was as if he was in slow motion pulling a curtain down, and as he would go, the painting was completely finished, as he painted, and it was white with the black dots underneath going down. And he would go all the way down to the bottom of this canvas, and then it would be this finished painting that would end up in a gallery or a museum in New York, but the whole process was invisible to the public. No one saw the amount of effort and care and all those different steps that he put into the drawing. But I learned so much from that, the idea that the idea should look really fresh, the painting Painting should look like you just made it in one day and at the same time you had done all this careful planning all this thinking had gone into the image before you got to that stage well anyway uh, after you'd be in his studio and you'd see how he was working uh, you then he would insist you'd go into the house and he would put a bottle of bourbon on the table and and then take out his banjo and begin playing songs and he'd want to sing folk songs and drink the bourbon and you couldn't leave until that bottle was empty so it didn't matter you were staying and you know you walk around the room with him and uh, there'd be a painting on the wall and he'd say would you like to know about that and I'd say sure tell me and he said well Fairfield Porter who was one of my idols at the time had made that painting I said, really, that's a Fairfield Porter? It's different. He said, yeah, I know. That's why I like it. And I said, well, tell me about it. He says, well, Fairfield came to visit me just like you did. And he said, and I have my pond out back. And he, after we, he was visiting me, uh, I told him, uh, I'm going to go painting. Would you like to go with me? And he said, yes, I would. And he said, but I don't have my paints. He said, well, I'll give you paint. So he said, I gave him a paint box and I gave him color. And we went to a site and we were painting. And uh, he was complaining the whole time. And I said, what's the matter, Fairfield? And he said, oh, I don't like these colors. I don't like anything about this. I don't like this canvas. I he went down a list and he said, he said I'm going to throw this painting away. And so he said, I said, Fairfield, uh, I like that painting. If you're going to throw it away, can I have it? He said, well, you can have it, but I get to pick one of yours. He said, okay, you can do that. So he said, we went back to the studio and I went into my studio and he walked over and he picked the very best painting in the room. He said, I think I'll take this one. And I said, okay, you can have it. So then he walked over to my pond. He took off his clothes and jumped into the water and had to break the ice. And he swam laps on my pond in the freezing water, got out of the pond, came back into the house, dried off, got dressed and went, went on his way. And uh, 
I said, really? That's the story of that painting? He said, yeah. So as you went around the room, there was a story with every picture, and it always involved somebody, Red Grooms, Alex Katz, or all these famous artists who would come to visit him. And anyway, I I really felt that in some ways, you know, uh, Neil was kind of like my artistic father. He was really giving me a, a, a real lesson in how to be an artist and a lesson in life. And Neil was ahead of the curve. He he lived in the Maine woods and flew every 10 days to Philadelphia to teach where he taught for four days and then he would go back to Maine where he, he painted. He also had a windmill on his property and he generated by wind power. He had 24 storage car batteries in his basement and they, he filled them with energy from the windmill. He was ahead of the curve. This is back in 1973. He was uh, using uh, wind power to create his electricity. Um, he had an experimental kind of uh, uh, composting toilet system in the house. Uh, he was really, you know, a, a guy who who uh, worshipped uh, the the fine American furniture that was made in the 18th century. He had examples of beautiful chairs and tables, the shaker things, and the house was a, a simple, quiet but a rambling 18th century farmhouse, completely restored, beautiful studio. And he, he had these kids uh, that were running around, and one of them is uh, uh, Titus Welliver today, who's a very famous actor. But anyway, he was just a little kid running around the house at the time. Anyway, I really felt a connection with Neil. And so over the years, uh, that, that connection continued. So my very last critique with Neil before I graduated, he came into my studio and uh, to get to my studio, he had to walk up six flights of very high stairs to get to my, my studio, walks in, he looks at my paintings and for the first time in three years, he didn't have anything to say about the paintings at all. He just turns to me and he tells me a story and I, I said, okay. Uh, he said, you know, uh, when I was at Yale and I was studying with Joseph Albers, uh, I, I really, you know, felt a good connection with Joseph. And he said, and I graduated and I went to New York and I had a studio and I painted for two years and then I had a show and, uh, my show was up and I was in my studio and the phone rings and I answered the phone. And as soon as I answered the phone, I knew it was Joseph Albers on the phone. And, uh, he said, uh, Neil, it's Joseph. And he said, yes, I know. And he said, Neil, I saw your show. And I, and that, Neil said, well, uh, Joseph, that's terrific. I, I really, I'm glad you did. I'm so happy. And he said, Neil, I saw your show three times. And he said, well, now I'm really impressed. I mean, that's amazing. And he said, Neil, do you think those paintings have color? And he said, well, I do. And, and with that, he said, Albert said, well, they don't. And he hung up. And, and that was the end of the story. And I looked at Neil and I'm waiting for the other shoe to drop and it didn't. And then he left and I said, what did that mean? I don't understand. And I kept thinking about it. Well, he never explained it. And the next time I saw him was about 15 years later and he was retiring from teaching and they were having a big party at the White Dog Cafe, Cafe in Philadelphia in the University of Pennsylvania. So I went there to this party and there was a couple hundred people in the room, artists from all these different years of studying with him. And I came into the room and as I came into the room, right at the door, there was a curator of drawing from the Philadelphia Museum who uh, was Ann Stein, who was standing right there and she knew me and she spoke to me. So we started to talk and I'm standing there talking with Ann and then I suddenly felt the presence that Neil Welliver had. And as I said, he was a small man, but he filled the room with his enormous personality. And I turned, and as I did, I saw him moving through this crowd of people in the room like a shark moving through a, tur a rough sea. And he was moving right at me, and he came right over, and he just pushed Ann Stein out of the way, and he puts his finger up right at my face, and he said, you... I've been seeing your work all over the place. And I said, well, gee, Neil, it's great to see you. 
and it's great to hear that you've seen some of my work. And he said, I've been seeing your work all over. And with that, he then took a fist and punched me hard enough to make me step back two steps in the chest as he hit me. And he turned around and he disappeared into the crowd. And at that moment, I understood what the meaning of the first story was. The story that he told me was that after studying with Joseph Albers and being one of his star students, Joseph had gone to see his show and realized that he couldn't deny that Neil was doing something interesting with his work, but he wasn't doing what Joseph had thought he would do or wanted him to do, but he couldn't deny that he was doing it. And now what Neil was telling me was, after all of his teaching, I was not doing what he wanted me to do, but he couldn't deny what I was doing. And it was his way of sharing with me that sense that sometimes a father gives to the son is, you know, I'm not happy with what you turned out to be, but I can't deny that you turned out to be something. And with that, uh, I put that in my in my memory as a kind of uh, a mentor who I can never forget, a mentor who I can really never get his words out of my ears. But at the same time, I did shake his influence from my work. I can still see its ghost, but you can't. Thank you for listening. If you have questions or suggestions for future episodes, please reach out to Frank Heider on Facebook or Instagram. We hope to see you at one of the next A Life in Art episodes.